Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Ashman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Ashman Family JCC empowers you to experience Jewish paths toward a life of joy, purpose, and meaning through innovative Jewish learning and wellness programs, community building, and initiatives to develop the next generation of Jewish leaders. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 263, Purim Torah. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rothberg. And depending on when you're listening to this episode, either happy almost Purim, happy Purim, or hope you had a happy Purim. But we normally release our episodes on Friday mornings, and this Friday morning is the holiday of Purim. But we thought that since our conversation with our guest today is about the book of Esther, it would actually make sense to be able to listen to it before Purim so that if we talk about anything that makes you think differently about the book of Esther, you might actually be able to take that into your Purim celebration with you, whatever that Purim celebration might be. So before we jump into the conversation, we just wanted to remind you of two things that we're doing for Purim in case you're listening to this in time to be able to do them before or on Purim. The first is called the Megillah Project, which you can find at www.megillahproject.com. That's M-E-G-I-L-L-A-H. And it's a collection of 30 plus videos, all of which are exploring the book of Esther from a variety of different angles, a wide variety of angles. And there's also an additional resources page there where we've gathered together links to just about everything that we could find on the internet about the book of Esther, including books and articles, but also many actresses have played Esther that I didn't know had ever played Esther, including Joan Collins. Who knew? So check all that out at the McGilla Project. And also, if you're listening to this on Thursday morning, join us tonight for a Purim celebration that we've called Purim Live. And you can find that at www.judaismunbound.com slash Purim 2021. We're doing it together with the Torah Studio. We're going to be talking to the founder of the Torah Studio in this series in a few weeks. And it's an unscrolled, unbound exploration of the 10 chapters of the Book of Esther with a different person leading us through each chapter. It's going to be a lot of fun. So join us there. And if you're listening to this after Thursday, well, you can't come this year, but hopefully you can come in a future year and you can certainly still enjoy the Megillah Project, which our guest today has actually done a short video for. So let's get into our conversation today with our guest, Anna Sol. She is a novelist who is the author of a book called The Book of V, which is a take on the Book of Esther story. There's a lot of layers to it. Some of it takes place in ancient Shushan or Susa. And there's two other layers in the story that take place in modern times and, of course, don't have to do with the Book of Esther story or do they? It's a really amazing novel and a really interesting read, and we're excited to talk about it today with trying to minimize spoilers. In addition to writing the Book of V, Anna Solomon has also written two other novels. One is called Leaving Lucy Pear, and the other one is called The Little Bride. She is a two-time winner of the Pushcart Prize. Her short fiction, essays, and reviews have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Plowshares, One Story, The Boston Globe, and elsewhere. She's the winner of many, many awards for her writing, and her short story, The Lobster Mafia Story, was chosen as Boston's One City, One Story read. Anna Solomon is co-editor of Labor Day, True Birth Stories by Today's Best Women Writers. And before becoming a novelist, she was an award-winning journalist for National Public Radio's Living on Earth. Anna Solomon is a graduate of Brown University and of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and she teaches writing at Barnard College, Warren Wilson's MFA program in creative writing, and the 92Y Unterberg Poetry Center. We think that the perspective of the arts is a critically important way to understand Judaism and to reimagine Judaism, and so we couldn't be more excited to explore a biblical story on or around the day that we actually read the story in the Jewish calendar with a novelist who has written a novel about the biblical story. It's going to open us up in all kinds of new ways to looking at the Bible. So Anna Solomon, welcome to Judaism Unbound. It's really great to have you. It's great to be here. So we've been doing this series on the Bible, and it's really exciting to be able to talk to somebody who's written a, I don't know what you call exactly, a biblical novel, a (laughs) novel that generates itself from a biblical story. But I I would love to start by understanding, like, how you chose to write a novel based on a biblical story. You know, you've written other books before. What, What was the process that brought you to take this on? 
the initial impulse really came from a children's book that I was given to read to my own kids, which was sort of a children's version of the book of Esther. I expected it to be simpler somehow or to kind of make the book of Esther more straightforward. And it turned out that it didn't at all. And it actually raised all of the questions that I'd always had about the book of Esther. But it was like, wait a second, why was it that I was always told that Esther was really, you know, super virtuous and it turns out she's a concubine in a harem? And what about this Vashti character who seems to actually have made what we would consider to be the, quote, virtuous choice by saying, no, I won't parade naked? There were all these questions and then plot holes. And Ahasuerus, who it seems by the end is sort of shocked by what Haman has been doing by this genocide, earlier on is like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, there's just so many, there's so many sort of plot holes and inconsistencies. And, and my kids had all sorts of questions. And it kind of made me want to go back to the book of Esther itself and investigate, um, which is not something I really have a lot of experience doing with biblical text. So that, that was sort of the initial impulse that drove me back with all of these questions. You know, a lot of times on this podcast, we've talked about wanting to have people, what we call regular Jews, you know, people that are unauthorized, <laughs> feel empowered to take on Jewish topics and Jewish practices and reimagine them. And a lot of people are intimidated to do that because they say, well, I'm not a rabbi. I didn't study. How do I know how to do it? You know, and so I really love to talk to somebody who's done that kind of audacious move of saying, well, I'm going to really, you know, come to this not as somebody who's had a tremendous amount of expertise before I started. And so I'm curious both about the process of getting started and did you feel intimidated in that way and how did you get over it? And also the process of like, how much research did you do until you felt confident to the point of saying, okay, yeah, I, I actually can write a novel about this. Or like you say, I, I can contribute Midrash to this book which, you know, other people say, well, I mean, who are you after 2000 years? <laughs> totally. It's a great question. And I am absolutely a regular Jew, as you say it. I love that term. And I think actually the, the what you said, so the, the research was totally tied into my getting to a point of being able to say, I can do this, but but not in the way you'd expect, not so much because I got to a point and I, I felt like I knew enough. It was because I got to a point and I realized that no one knows. And so it gave me the freedom to go in. You know, I mean, I, I began by going to my rabbi. This is in um, Park Slope, Brooklyn at Congregation Beth Elohim, Rachel Timoner. She's really wonderful and sort of saying- A past guest. Oh, yeah? Um, she's so great. And I said, you know, where do I even start? And I was really open about how little I knew. And she really, you know, it was like in her office showed me. So here's where you can even begin to go looking for interpretations, translations, other stories, um, Midrash, of course. And I think for me, one of the things that was very freeing in particular was, was reading the very ancient rabbis takes on um, the book of Esther, which were wild, like really, really wild things that don't have any seem to have any basis in the book itself. Like in one Haman's daughter, um, Haman has a daughter, first of all, and she mistakes Haman for Mordecai or the other way around in, the, in parade and drops feces on his head, on her father's head. <laughs> and it's like, where does that come from? And, and many things like this. And I think the more I read and the more outrageous it all was, I thought, well, if, if the ancient Babylonian rabbis could do this, then I guess I can too, you know? I wanted to talk a little bit about how your book is structured, because on the one hand, it's not unique to your book. There are many books that have a structure where, you know, chapter by chapter, there's sort of different, I guess it's not different narrators in your case, but different protagonists. I remember Correct. reading uh, As I Lay Dying in School Growing Up by William Faulkner, which was like my first time with that. And I like didn't like that book because I found <laughs> it very disorienting. But I do, I have grown into that style. And I bring it up because I actually think you could see it as like, oh, interesting counterintuitive style for a novel. Or you could say, when it comes to biblical text, I'll speak for myself. This is how I read it, basically. Like, when I'm reading a biblical text, my process in my head is like, ah, for a smidge, I am in the text. I am, like, in the book of Esther. And then I'm flashing to my life. Mm. And then I'm back to the book of Esther. And then maybe I'm to my parents' lives or my ancestors recently. But what was happening in terms of the structure of the book and in what ways might it actually have something to teach us about how to approach 
whether it's biblical texts or any kinds of ancient texts that we work with. Yeah, it's so interesting what you say when you describe the way that you read biblical texts and that you're going between them to your own life and to other, you know, to your ancestors, et cetera. Because I think that's how, I think that's sort of how we read any text in a way. I mean, we're always projecting ourselves into it and onto it, and um, whether consciously or or sort of subconsciously. And so I think in a way, the weaving, as you're talking about, that I do in this book between these different narrators and really with that between these very different times because there's the there's contemporary Brooklyn, there is 1970s Washington DC, and then there's ancient Persia, is meant to really have the effect that you're talking about that you have when you read, which is which is to bring us closer together and to reckon with not only how much has changed, but actually how much continues to be the same and how how shaped we are by the stories that have come before us and how shaped we continue to be. And that we become, I think, then also more aware of the power of the stories we are telling now, you know, to ourselves, to our children, to the people around us, and the effect that that will have on their lives and their future. The potential for that kind of writing, but also for reading, is to make those connections and maybe be a little more conscious of our own powers as we, as we tell our stories. So I'm curious to talk about something a little weird, which is the genre of this book. And I mean that not in the general sense of like, which section of the bookstore should this book live in today? But I actually am thinking of a conversation we had recently with Ronald Hendel, um, where we talked about like, what genre even is the Bible in full? Or if you broke it down into particular books, like what genre is the book of Esther? What genre are various books? And I ask because... I think so often, I asked the the genre of your book because I hear in Jewish spaces, there's actually a real openness to to seeing books like this as a kind of midrash. And and when I say midrash, for those who aren't so familiar, it's a Hebrew word that refers roughly to, I mean, I often call it fan fiction, but basically there's a long (laughs) line. And I I mean that seriously, right? Like, like, Like there's a set of books that come out beginning in the early centuries of the common era that are looking at the Bible, especially at the Torah, but also some, but also other books of the Bible, and just saying, oh, here's all, all this stuff that happened between the lines or behind the scenes, director's cut. Um, and like you said, the rabbis have wild ideas of what those between the line things are, and that's all allowed. And so I'm I appreciate calling contemporary books like this Midrash. That said, I actually sometimes want to go a step further because I think most people's approach to Midrash is that it is between the lines and is not in fact the lines. I actually feel that it's good for us to take stories like this and see them as almost the text itself, or at the very least, a commentary, more like, you know, the Rashi stuff that's in the sidebar of the the Torah books that people own, as opposed to like a separate book that's just filling in the lines. Because I think that like future Purims, when there's that chapter one and Vashti comes up, I will be thinking of this book. <laughs> it, it's actually not going to be separate. Like th- this will be, in fact, embedded in my own religious experience. And you could say that, like, people could say that that's like bad because somehow I'm being influenced by an external book. Or we could say, wow, what does that mean for the the role authors like you have in contributing to religious Jewish experience? Yeah, no, I love that idea. I, I mean, I think you're speaking to something to me that's very core about Jewishness, I guess, which is this sort of perpetual openness to questions. You know, I was taught these stories as sort of already put together like a building, but I was also taught that I could question them and that I could play with them. Um, Being something that not only can we bring closer to our lives, but also should bring closer to our lives and should bring our lives closer to it, right? Like that's how we are going to keep it relevant. I mean, I love that you read the book that way. And I, I wrote the book that way. I think it's it's a, um, and I wasn't technical about this, like, oh, well, these aspects adhere really closely to the book of Esther. And in these, I'm going to, to kind of depart. The characters that I developed in ancient Persia felt true to me to the characters in the book of Esther. Um, now, the specifics of what they did were often different. But when, when I would take one thing, like, the ambiguity in the original Hebrew text 
around what Mordecai's role was to Esther, um, that it wasn't always clear that he was simply her uncle, that there may have been an attraction or a relationship between them. Like that, I took that and ran with it. Um, I did kind of follow my instincts in that way. And so I, I like the idea of it not being apart from it. It's sort of hopefully adding to it. And then there's a symbiosis. And I think when you have an original text and as many texts as we have now that have grown out of them, they do change the original. That I think that that's okay. Not to go away from the from from biblical text, but I think you know every book is written in response to earlier books, um, and in some ways, you know, alters and changes them and and reshapes them. I'm curious about some of the specifics in your book, and it's funny because when I read, I mean, this is partly me as you know regular Jew reader, and also partly me as relatively well-informed regular Jew reader who then reads this book and there are things in it that it makes me wonder, like, is there an actual, you know, pre-existing midrash about this somewhere that I don't know about? So for example, there are all kinds of sort of magical things that Esther does, some of which are a little kind of scary. And is that something that there are actual Jewish commentators that have written about that Esther had magical powers? Or was that something that you made up? And how far did you take it from where what sources you might have found? Yeah, that's something that I pretty much made up on my own. But I it was inspired both by the, the illustrated book, the children's book that I was given, because there are some illustrations that show her her face and her hands and this kind of like posture that she's in that was in a very powerful way that felt sort of like sorcery. Um, and at the same time, there was actually this other children's book. This was at a time we were doing a lot of PJ library books. And I, maybe this is one you've seen. It was like about, I don't even know what holiday, but it was a, there was a goblin that was involved. Herschel and the Hanukkah goblins. And there's a link for anybody listening who's interested in getting it in the show notes. And suddenly, as I was starting to write the ancient Persia parts, which I was very intentionally writing to feel explicitly imaginative and reminding the reader, I mean, the first line when you get to ancient Persia in the book is the camp is as you imagine, which is not to say it is as it was. Like I was really trying to draw attention to the fact that nobody knows. Um, so anyway, I was as I was kind of exploring the tone that I wanted to set in that time, this goblin appeared. He has this counterfeit coin that he gives this kid, and it actually winds up being the catalyst for the whole plot, um, along with Jewish mysticism, which I had known about for, for a while, um, not a lot about, but like Kabbalah, um, that there also was a very strong tradition of practical magic in Jewish people dating way back. Apparently, there were like best-selling manuals of practical magic in ancient times. I don't know what best-selling meant in ancient times, but people love these books, apparently. These were instructions for how to do spells, instructions for how to turn one thing into another. And um, so that, I think, really gave me permission, again, to kind of keep playing with that, because where it led me was, was a way to explore power in relationship to Esther in a way that felt very much of a piece with my other characters in, in more contemporary times. There's a lot of Jewish practices that we talk about as just ritual that if you look into <laughs> historical sources, if you, like, they start from sort of a magical kind of place. And often, by the way, from a magical place associated with women that then gets pushed aside in favor of like the masculine world of sort of official synagogue worship or ritual. So we should recognize that. And it's Absolutely. important to... to work against that now. Um, so switching gears a bunch, I, I was I was struck by, once again, the ways in which in reading this book, I felt that my own approach to Bible in many ways was affected and that I grew. And one thing, I, like if you had asked me a few weeks ago, Lex, you're a recently ordained rabbi, is there like a deep Jewish textual tradition or approach to questions of a second wife after a previous marriage in the contemporary world? Like, how how should I go about, like, addressing that through a Jewish lens? I think I would, like, rack my brain and maybe come up with some interesting ideas. I don't think I would come back with, like, yes, there is a huge barrel of stuff to work with here. And your book, beautifully, both through the the Esther parts in Persia and through the contemporary parts talk, uh, talks about 
or I mean, maybe not directly talks about, but shows how that really is a kind of archetype. There's Esther, and you even mentioned that Eve, in a certain sense, from Adam and Eve, is a second wife in a certain sense, because there's the idea of Lilith from some of those fun Midrash, as we talked about earlier, who is this figure that predates Eve and is the first wife of Adam. And, and then I started thinking, and this is where like my own growth came. I was like, oh, Rachel's a second wife in Genesis. Leah gets married to Jacob first in that whole problematic thing where the dad lies about which daughter is being married off. So Rachel's also a second. Like we've got this big old list of second wives. in, And now the stories aren't told from their perspectives. But now we have a chance through your book to sort of address something that is more from their perspective. So I, like that's one example. I'm curious, are there other hidden kinds of Jewish topics like second wife-ness <laughs> that, that you sort of seek to unpack in your book or at least open up from a Jewish lens that we might have been thinking, that we might not have been thinking were like particularly Jewish topics before? Certainly second wives were something that I wanted to kind of explore and explode a little bit in the book. But with that also very importantly, sort of the first wife who whose absence in a sense, certainly in the story of, in the book of Esther is what allows the story to happen, right? So, I mean, part of what I wanted to explore was the, the kind of the presence of, of the absent characters. So I think another thing that strikes me as possibly kind of fitting into to the kinds of questions you're asking is sort of the way in which Jews, this might sound odd, but sort of leave a place. <laughs> Our stories are so often about escape, liberation, however, you know, you could see it as escape, you can see it as liberation, you could see it in, and I, I think it's actually very interesting in, in, now that I'm thinking about it, in Vashti's case, actually, and then in my character, Vivian Bars. Um, you know, we very much see Vashti as having been banished. And when I talk about my character, Vivian Barr, who is my Vashti in the 70s, she is also banished. But that, you know, that party that sort of does her in, I would say also sort of saves her. Um, and so there's a way in which I think we often also like these these notions of, you know, what what enslaves us versus what frees us is something worth thinking about. And just on a, on a plot level, I was interested in, and when you read the book and you see the ancient Persia part, like, well, how does it happen? Like, at what point do the Jews know to go, right? And we have some stories that really sort of tell us how that happens in a lot of detail in terms of like Moses, right? But we also have this kind of, I have at least a very vague sense of over time, like, well, we're just people who go, <laughs> and then we spread out, and then we go again, and then we spread out. And the book gave me a chance to kind of play with what might go into that. Maybe we're back to this question of genre. Like, I'm, I'm curious about the move from, of genre, potentially, from the book of Esther, which I think, you know, many of us have learned to understand it as kind of a satire, or a farce, or something that where the characters are kind of buffoonish and strange. And the genre of your book is much more serious than that. Uh, I've been thinking about the book of Esther as a book about... Uh, having the courage of our convictions, you know, that that Esther, there's this moment where Mordecai says to Esther, like, maybe it's just for this moment that you've been placed in this high position, right? So that now there's finally an issue where you have to save our society. And if if not now that you're in this position, if you're not willing to use your power and your influence to save our society, then what was the point of you ever rising to that high position? And I'm thinking a lot about our politicians these days, but what's the point of having your position if you're not willing to use it to do the right thing when that most important of time comes. So that's a that's a very heavy kind of take to put on a book that might, after all, at the end of the day, be a satire. But that's a similar choice as, as I think that you made to really take this seriously as a book that is about second wives and first wives and feminism <laughs> and all this stuff. And so I'm curious about the process of doing that. Or was that something in your mind? Or how do you look at it from this vantage point? This book believe it or not, is, and I actually do think there's a lot of humor in it. it um, it's much funnier than my previous books. And I really enjoyed like allowing it to be funny, especially the more contemporary parts. Um, that said, it's certainly not, you know, it does not belong to the same genre, as you say, as the book of Esther. Um, and it wasn't created as the book of Esther, you know, as I've come to accept sort of the interpretation that the book of Esther was really created to create 
Purim, um, which is this carnival holiday where, you know, power structures get turned upside down and the low are high and the high are low. And, you know, the Jews wind up committing their own genocide by the end. And they're like, yay, that's great. Um, it's, it, you know, it's a wild, crazy book. So I think in terms of women's lives and choices and feminism, I think where I really, what really kind of woke me up was seeing the ways in which the stories that I had been told about the story um, and, you know, at Purim and in the spiel were so at odds with the story itself. Why was that? You know, so that, and that there were these binaries that were created. It was like, okay, if you're a young girl, you watch this spiel, this is at least, it, this, was, this was true in the 80s and 90s, and I think it's still true to some degree now. It's like, oh, so that's Vashti. She is bad, and she's selfish, and she is now gone. <laughs> and that woman is Esther, and she is beautiful, and she is brave, and she is <laughs> virtuous, and that's who you want to be. You know, once I went into the text and or and even just looked at it plainly without this gauze over it of of these dichotomies, I was like, but that's just not true because this one is a concubine in the harem and that one is says like, no, I will not take off my clothes for you. So like what what gives, you know? And I think that's what got me really thinking about the ways in which our I don't know if it's right to say misinterpretations, but our, you know, I think we we tell the stories that we that we need to hear, but we also tell the stories or the, the stories that have been passed on to us often are ones that are sort of meant to make us think in certain ways and to shape society in certain ways. Um, and I think that's particularly true for women, mostly because women have often not been the storytellers. And so the storyteller, the stories that have, that have been passed down to us often really reduce us to these kinds of types. And so a large part of what drew me to this, to wanting to explore this book and to write my novel was to kind of try to break down some of that idea around type. In a way, I mean, I don't write with an idea of having a thesis, but in a way to kind of really throw out my, my strong belief that, that women and people, hum, human beings, are, are far more complex than many of our stories would lead us to believe. If we see the genre, the register of Purim as, like you say, and I totally agree with this, that there was a holiday and then they wrote the story to justify the holiday. And that seems obvious for a holiday like Purim because it's so similar to other holidays that take place in the same time of year that have similar practices like Mardi Gras or, you know, and of course there are ancient Persian and Babylonian holidays that are similar. And so if everybody in the world has a holiday of reversals and king for a day and all kinds of things like that on this particular time of year, then it probably doesn't actually come from this story that happens to be you know, one that has those same themes. But I'm thinking about, you know, one of the ideas about this kind of reversals, right? The idea that, you know, in these kind of ancient king for a day holidays, I think the idea was that you would take a lowly person and make them the king and make the king serve that person, which we see with Haman and Mordechai, basically. But that in a story of reversals, it would be a story where the women would be in charge, right? Because mm. in the ancient world, the women were the lowly. And so a story where the women are in charge is kind of a story that's, yeah, that's our once one day a year story where we say, because this could never happen. This is ridiculous, right? This is not. And um, what's interesting, though, is to say, OK, so maybe that the fact that the book of Esther is anchored in the stories of women in its original writing was part of the farce. But now we can, and many women do, hold on to this as a precious story of a woman being in charge or a woman having a significant role. And that story that started as farce now becomes a feminist manifesto. And the farcical element of it has to go away and should and ought to, right? You know, what, what's, what I'm just remarking on is that it's it's striking to me that at least for me as a man, maybe, and as a, a reader of um, who needs some help reading an original text and doesn't always get it, I get there through your novel and through you talking about your novel. And, and then in that case, it really starts to feel like this is important more than Midrash. This is important commentary that helps a new generation of Jews sort of reimagine their relationship with different parts of the story. I mean, you know, I, I know a lot of times an artist wants to say, look, I just make the art, you know, <laughs> but it's for critics to talk about its meaning. But, but I'm curious about whether you had feelings like that as you were writing on reflection, if it makes you feel uncomfortable or if it makes you feel great. <laughs> 
No, I think I love it. You know, there's a difference between sort of recognizing there's always a gap between what I am conscious of doing as I write a book and what I later understand myself to have been doing. And often one of the great gifts of having readers, right, is actually helping me grasp that. I mean, I think that like that's part of the the delight of the process. I think if it's if it's done right, then you wind up with room for the text to grow. I think what you're talking about though is this very um sort of really, really important and powerful act of what what it is to reclaim a story. Okay, a story in this case that was just farce, well, I'm going to kind of own it and I'm going to make something really powerful out of it. And really, I mean, it might've been powerful as farce too, right? It had a a purpose in that shape or form and it's gonna have a different purpose in this shape or form. I really love that. And I mean, I think for me, one of the interesting things in my research that I discovered was also that, you know, before even people came to, that even the understanding of it fully as farce for some people is quite contemporary because a lot of people until certainly into the 20th century saw it as history. Um, like when you read Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, edited this book called The Woman's Bible, that I, there's an epigraph to my novel that's from that. And she her, the quote, I think, is, um, I've always regretted that the historian let Vashti fall out of sight so quickly or something like that. And so to her and many people of that era, they saw this as history. And the book poses as history. It has, it's full of dates and edicts and, you know, official language. Um, And it wasn't really even until I did this research, and there's a great uh, JPS commentary by Adele Berlin, that I fully understood how much, or I I kind of saw all of that as its own posturing, right, as part of the farce. But I guess this is to say that people have continually been shifting the genre of the Book of Esther. It's very gratifying to hear your experience with it in that way, with the Book of V. So, okay, I want to really dwell in what you said here and what you hinted at in your book. It is messed up that Vashti is pushed aside, not only pushed aside, but that she's seen as this like somehow bad character and Esther, who you, you talked about, like the concubine thing and the harem, like, like, like um, I just said harem in the harem. <laughs> um, that's a funny little slip. Um, but like, Very Jewish. Yes. Um, I want to interrogate that because I see this as an important, I don't know, test case or something, because I want to talk in this unit we're doing on on how we explore Bible stories on heroes and villains. We have done some really bad things because our process of, we being the Jewish people for thousands of years, not like people listening or like particular (laughs) institutions, we have done problematic things because we often start from a place of, ah, these are the heroes of the story. These are the bad people of the story. And we're going to interpret everything based on that starting point, that these heroes are good and these bad people are bad. And I've talked about this on the podcast in other stories where I look at the story. This is like a tangential story that people don't know that well, but like the story of Balaam and Balak in the book of Numbers, where Balaam, it turns into this really negative, terrible character in rabbinic commentaries. But when you just read the Bible text itself, Mm. he seems pretty good. Korach is another example where like Korach is this rebel and he's posed as this person who like wants nothing more than to dethrone Moses and to challenge even God in certain senses. But like when I read that text, it seems like a guy who kind of wanted to spread out equalized horizontal power and not have everything be top down. Like I'm with them in many ways. And so I think Esther Vashti is a good test case because in those book of numbers things, it's still kind of complicated, right? Like you could read Korach as either direction. Is he really out for himself? Is he really out for the people? With Vashti, it's like she's told to do a thing that pretty much all of us would tell our friends, loved ones, children not to do. (laughs) She says no. And then she's bad for it. Like, what the hell? Like, that's like and and yet. You're right that in many Hebrew schools, in many places, we talk about it as if Esther is the unabashedly good character and Vashti isn't. Now, I will say, I think even in the past few decades, we've taken a lot of strides on this particular issue. I do think there are many Hebrew schools that talk about the good sides of Vashti. But 
there are many that don't. And so my question there is not, you know, to just throw blame at people, but like, what does that show us, not just about this story, but about the room we have to grow with all our stories, where we've sort of subconsciously accepted this presumption that everybody's sort of the good one or the bad one, as opposed to something more complicated? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it speaks to the fact that stories have tremendous power and that storytellers and commentators and interpreters and translators, right, usually have an agenda. (laughs) Um, And often that agenda involves, you know, making things less ambiguous than they actually are, or and and, and, um, meaning actually are in the story, like taking a text that may actually have room for ambivalence and reducing it to dichotomies, to binaries, to good, bad, et cetera, I don't think it's just religion that is sort of guilty of that. I I think that that's true of Hollywood. You know, I mean, it's something that we've, that that I think runs through a lot of popular storytelling, but that is very dangerous um, in its own right. And that, you know, our job hopefully as, as readers and maybe as writers and certainly as storytellers, because we all tell stories in our lives is to sort of poke at that and question those interpretations and like, and, and go to the text itself and see, in fact, what we take from it, you know, not necessarily just take these interpretations at their word because the people who pass them on are known to be quote authoritative or known to be rabbis. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how you would mine a story like this one and find new insight? How, how could somebody be a better reader of Jewish texts? I think for people who are interested in kind of exploring further texts that provoke them, and by provoke, I mean that in a good way, like that make you wonder or make you angry or make you confused, whatever it is, take one line, you know, start with one line that moves you in some way and allow that to kind of bloom in in, wherever it goes. And I actually even would encourage people to start with thinking about writing a poem. Like, you know, don't, you know, don't start with like, I'm, how could I write a novel about this? Or how could I write a screenplay or how, you know, it's like it, it all actually begins or the power of it begins in the specificity. And you can't locate that without honing in, getting quiet with it and being willing to really kind of allow that, allow it to unspool. Was there a particular line in Esther that was your anchor? There's, you know, a very funny one from early, and this is in Adele Berlin's translation is from the, from the banquet. The rule was drink, <laughs> which I was like, what? That's so funny. And I just stole it and put it in the book. But, um, and, you know, and there are many others. I think I've always been very interested. It didn't necessarily become totally defining for this book, but was actually quite important to me in an earlier book I wrote, unbeknown, you know, I didn't realize its connection, um, which is like, if I perish, I perish. Lines like that, like, what what does this mean? And where might it lead? (laughs) And how does it speak to me? I have this feeling that, like, there's a way that I've seen artists read Jewish texts in a way that actually is so right, because it's it's kind of obvious the, the certain emotional things are obvious to a certain kind of reader and a lot of us don't necessarily see it and that's where like the ancient commentators were helpful but they were only helpful to a point because there were things that they didn't see because for example they were all men or they were <laughs> living in a certain time and i'm thinking about something in particular that that really uh, i felt strongly in your story which was kind of the sinister dimension of mordechai and, you know, we're doing this Megillah project where we have all these 30 different videos. People should check it out, megillaproject.com. That, Great plug. <laughs> um, but one of them is our friend Ayalon Eliach, who was a previous guest here. And he has this take where he found that Rava, who's the Talmudic rabbi who says you should get so drunk on Purim that you can't tell the difference between Mordechai and Haman, that actually elsewhere in the Talmud, Rava says that alcohol helps you, helps clarify your thinking, not muddle your thinking. So what it means to get so drunk that you don't see the difference between Haman and Mordechai is that there actually is no difference between Haman Uh. and Mordechai. And only in getting so drunk are you able to see what's true, what's always been there. And that Mordechai, 
I think Rava's point is that Mordechai's uh, real sin is that he refused to bow down to Haman. And actually, there's no problem in Judaism to bow down to a king or a, a prime minister. That's not a problem. And so because of his own ego, oh. he put the entire Jewish people at, right. at risk. Right. Yeah, and, totally. <laughs> right. And then there's another part of Mordechai, which is that, like, basically, he pimped out his, his niece, you know, exactly. right? And, and yes. there's a great, uh, you know, great uh, humorous video that, that we, we shared together and that's on the website there. And so, like, I'm curious there whether that sort of sinister dimension to Mordechai was just clear to you as a sensitive and careful reader, or was it something that came from, from reading commentaries or from some other mechanism? I think it came from the commentaries um, and in the kind of debates over the translation of the Hebrew, which I can't say anything about because I don't read Hebrew, but I only can, I can read various interpretations of it. There's some language and maybe, maybe one of you can, can elucidate this or I could go back to the text, but there's language where it's ambiguous about Mordechai's relationship to her. And in fact, whether she might've been a wife as opposed to a niece. So, you know, so to me, it's like, okay, it's latent here. There's something latent here. And then there is this fact of like, well, he's the one who really gets them all in trouble in the first place. And then he's the one who tries to like solve it by sending her there. And the more that I, you know, when I really looked at the text and thought about what it means to go, it would be like, well, that wouldn't actually necessarily have been what this young woman wanted to do. Um, and so, so what's the deal? And so that kind of, it, it out of that kind of Mordecai's character developed for me. It was important to me, and I and I hope this comes through in the book, that he's also not fully, e it's not like he's fully evil. Like we, we see his own struggle, you know, both in terms of his own powerlessness um, and in terms of what the Persians are doing, in terms of both his like mix of love and dismay about his son, who is not sort of strong enough and not the son that he thought he would have, and his wrestling with his intense feelings or intense attraction, I should say, to his to his niece, which he knows he should not have, but he does. I really love that idea that in part of the what you brought up, that like it's not just about getting so drunk and therefore having no idea who's who, but also getting so drunk that you can see clearly that they are one and the same. So I have a question that is a bit of a gear shift, but I am curious to talk about conversion a little bit conversion from folks who are not Jewish to Jewish. There, that's another, I don't know, issue, question, topic that you don't like insert a prose take of, ah, here's what I think about conversion. But through your characters, there's some really interesting work you do to shine a light on folks who do convert to Judaism. And so I, I'm thinking of one prominent character in your book, and there's a moment where certain folks, and apologies for the moderate spoilers, um, there's a moment where certain folks are like, why does she convert to Judaism? Like, I'm not going to say precisely why they're confused, but due to the nature of the story, <laughs> it like seems like the reason for converting would not necessarily be there anymore. So like, why is she converting? And yet we also see that this character has a rich Jewish identity. And so I was curious to hear your just thoughts on the role that conversion plays in the story, and to some extent, how that intertwines with broader questions of, for lack of a better phrase, like Jew and non-Jew, like that there are ways in which the story of Esther in its original form can be understood as a, as a commentary on Jew and Gentile. I mean, there's a whole thing where Esther in the texts, maybe she's sort of hiding the fact that she's Jewish for a while and pretending to not be Jewish. And then it's a whole thing when she is Jewish and the king then like reverses his order. Like it's also, by the way, historically, a lot of people trace the origin story of the term Jew to the book of Esther. So hmm. I guess I, all that's to say, like, you take on interesting questions of what it means to be Jewish, what it means to not be Jewish, what that means in relation to holidays like Purim, in relation to, I don't know, one's existence in the world. How were you pondering that as you wrote the story and now? You're right. I think that in the story itself, there there is this sort of, again, it's kind of latent there. And there is that kind of don't ask, don't tell aspect of the plot where Mordecai is like, you don't have to mention the, the Jewish part. Personally, I've always been very shaped by feeling both very clearly Jewish and also 
among people who are not Jewish, which is how I, I grew up among most of the community I was in was not Jewish. And so, you know, there was always this way in which I felt that meant that I felt both in, you know, it didn't just affect the way I felt about Jewishness. It also affected the way that I felt about the place where I was of because I was both, I felt very native there. And then I also felt outside it. So that's, that's always kind of a question that I'm interested in exploring. And in terms of conversion, I am really interested in the ways in which people, most of us in a lot of ways have sort of multiple lives within one life, right? Like, like multiple phases. We are different people to some degree during, through different parts of our lives. And how do we mark those shifts? And how do we mark them, especially when those shifts, as in the case of the character you're talking about, are very drastic and in many ways um, really painful and in some ways very shameful and maybe also very liberating. I'm, I think I'm interested, and I don't know if this, this sort of dilutes a little, but in the way that people, I think, convert sometimes many times in their life whether it's, you know, actually into, into or out of a religion or it's sort of into or out of some other identity, a name, a, you know, what, in what ways do we get to choose who we are? One specifically to sort of conversion to Judaism, I've been lucky enough to have some close friends who've converted and I've been very struck by not only how much more they know than I do um, because of the process that they've gone through at an older age, but also sort of how deeply Jewish they feel themselves to be and, and how important their Judaism is to them. And so I think that was something that, you know, that I've always just been interested in and so allowed myself to explore. So we clearly love the book of V and at the risk of like putting pressure on you, please don't take this as that, but are you thinking about doing more of this in the future? Are you thinking of, you know, finding some other books of the Bible and playing around with them in the way that you did here? Or did you sort of do this once and decide, well, I think I think that's enough and I'm going to go in different directions. What's what's next? And are you thinking of going in any other creative directions with Jewish flavored fiction? I, I'm kind of starting to settle on and, you know, I may in a year tell you that nothing came of it, but exploring the Sarah Hagar Abraham triangle but in this case, in a, in a fully contemporary way. So like there's all, it's all now. And in, in part because I've always been interested in questions around surrogacy. So I'm playing with that. And it wasn't what I expected. And right now, the way I'm writing it is much less um, explicitly tied. Like I don't know that there would be explicit references, but maybe more buried ones. But I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of playing around with that and seeing where it leads me and doing a lot of reading, but also just kind of trying to write forward and, and let myself explore. Thank you so much, Anna Solomon, for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you so much to all of you out there for listening. And once again, happy Purim. We are thrilled to be releasing this episode just a smidge early this week on Thursday instead of Friday. We hope that some of you are listening to this on that debut date so that this is preparation for Purim. But you know, if it's on Purim or after Purim, also great. Glad that you were able to enjoy this episode. Also, this episode has been one of our episodes in this ongoing unit on the Bible from all sorts of different angles, and we really hope that you will listen in to the remainder of the episodes in this series that are coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, and we also love, after, before, while you're listening to those episodes, if you're down to send us a note and be in touch with us. And there are a wide variety of ways that you can do that. First, you can head to our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. All of our accounts are just at Judaism Unbound on those various apps. You can go to our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And you can email us at dan at judaismunbound.com or lex at judaismunbound.com. If you are looking for awesome ways to spend your Purim or even spend your after Purim, the on Purim avenue that we offer is Purim Live, which is tonight, if you're listening to this on Thursday, the 25th of February. It already happened if you're listening later, so sorry. But it's Purim Live. You can join us by going to judaismunbound.com slash Purim2021 and signing up. You will be able to come to our Zoom event, and it's going to be a really fun time. If it's after Purim, but you still want to get some post-Purim learning in, some post-Purim viewing in, you can head to the Megillah Project, which is accessible at megillaproject.com. That's M-E-G-I-L-L-A-H project.com. And it features all sorts of videos from scholars and artists and wonderful people looking at the Book of Esther. So we hope that you'll take some of those opportunities. We also hope if you are able 
that you might send us a donation. And you can do that at judaismunbound.com slash donate on either a monthly recurring basis or just as a one-time gift. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.